In section four, we're going to discuss how the shapes of molecules change as they rotate around single bonds. These different shapes form what we call conformations. And we're going to be discussing the conformations both of carbon chains and then later on of rings. We're going to start by looking at the conformations of ethane. If we look at the three-dimensional structure of ethane, using a model for example, and we imagine it rotating around the carbon-carbon bond, we can see that the ethane forms basically an infinite number of shapes as the angle between the hydrogens on the two separate atoms changes. However, there are two limiting structures, sort of maximally different or maximally similar structures. And since we can definitely define these structures, we call these two structures conformations. The two structures that we're talking about are drawn here using dashes and wedges in a three-dimensional drawing. The first structure has the hydrogens completely unaligned on the front carbon and the back carbon. We call this structure the staggered structure. By rotating around this single bond here, rotating these hydrogens, we can rotate them so that the hydrogens completely align and the angle between them is zero degrees. We call this the eclipsed structure. Now, these two structures are technically stereoisomers because they have the same formulas, the same connectivity, but they have a different arrangement of atoms in three-dimensional space. So we call these conformational isomers. Conformational isomers are isomers that interconvert by rotating around single bonds. In order to better look at conformational isomers of chain molecules, we use a new way of drawing structures called the Newman projection. In the Newman project projection, what we do is we pick a specific bond of the molecule. We then rotate the molecule so that our eye is looking straight down that specific bond from the front atom to the back atom with the front and back atom perfectly aligned. If we do that, what we see is that for a tetrahedral molecule, the bond that we were looking along would be pointing straight away from us on the front atom, and then the three other bonds would be arranged in a sort of a propeller like this, with equal angles between them of 120 degrees, and they would technically be sticking out at us. The back atom would be completely hidden by the front atom, and the three bonds on the back atom would be partially hidden. So what we see in this picture then is this dot right here represents the front atom with three bonds connected to it. Then the big circle represents the back side of the back atom and then the three bonds that are partially uh, drawn that don't connect in the middle are the rear bonds, are the bonds connected to the back atom. One of the things that we can do in a structure like this is we can get a very good idea of the angle between a given bond attached to the front molecule and an adjacent bond attached to the back molecule. We call this angle the dihedral angle. In the staggered conformation, which would look like this in a Newman projection, we can see that the dihedral angle between a hydrogen on the front and then an adjacent hydrogen on the back would be 60 degrees. If we were to draw the Newman projection of the eclipsed conformation, which we could get by rotating the front atom so that the bonds move down until they are at the same angle, in other words, the dihedral angle becomes zero, we would see that the three groups in front overlap the three groups and bonds in the back, 
And in fact, what we normally have to do is slightly offset the bonds in the front and back so that we can kind of see both those. This would be the eclipsed conformation. One of the important things about conformations is that they don't have identical potential energies often. So what we can do is we can draw an energy profile. An energy profile correlates a particular structure with its potential energy. And by drawing the structures in order as we rotate around a bond, we can begin to see how the potential energy changes during the rotation. So, for example, this would be the staggered conformation of ethane. And using this hydrogen as a reference point, we would put that hydrogen at zero degrees of rotation. If we then rotate that hydrogen 60 degrees, we would then create an eclipsed conformation. We would then rotate the hydrogen continuing past the rear hydrogen out to here, where now we were 60 degrees apart again, and that would be another staggered conformation. Then we could rotate again to create an another eclipsed, rotate again to create another staggered, and essentially, if we kept rotating, we would end up back where we started. Now, when we look at potential energy, when we have an axis like this, our intention is that down here, at the lower part of the axis, that would be a low amount of potential energy. Whereas up here, that would be a high amount of potential energy. Now, when thinking about potential energy, there's an inverse relationship between low potential energy and stability. So a low potential energy indicates a high amount of stability, whereas a high potential energy indicates a low amount of stability. The reason for that relates to the definition of potential energy. Potential energy is defined as the potential for a system to change. If we then think about the definition of stable and unstable, a stable system has a low likelihood of change, whereas an unstable system has a high likelihood of change. So when we have a low potential energy, we say we have a low likelihood to change, we say it's stable. Now, another term that I often use that to sort of help us understand this is I use a term that sort of anthropomorphizes the molecules. In other words, it gives them human characteristics. Now, some chemists don't like it when people do this because molecules are not intelligent and they don't have emotions and other characteristics like that. But we can often use analogies like this to help us better understand the behavior of a system in a scientific environment. So for example, when a molecule is stable, it has a low desire to change, which means that it's basically happy. When a person is happy with their situation, they have a low desire, a low incentive to change that situation. In contrast, when a molecule is unstable, it has a high desire to change. And we would sort of, by analogy, say the molecule is unhappy. When a person is unhappy, they have a high desire to change their situation. And so what we can see is that stable, low potential energy molecules are happy. And unstable, high potential molecules are unhappy. Now, if we look at our specific situation here, what we find is that the staggered has a low potential energy, whereas the eclipsed has a higher potential energy. And in fact, the difference between those two potential energies is about three kilocalories per mole of molecules. 
all of our energies are going to be expressed as an energy unit per mole, but correspondingly, that means that each individual molecule would have a potential energy difference. So very often, we're just going to eliminate or leave out the per mole, and we'll just say there's a three kilocalorie difference with the understanding that we mean per mole of molecules. The other thing about energy differences as we discuss them in organic chemistry. We, um, in physics, and in really most modern sciences, even somewhat including chemistry, the modern unit of energy that's used is the joule. And joules are a perfectly fine unit, and they're used in many different situations. However, there was an older energy unit, the kilocalorie, and in fact, there's a conversion factor. So there's roughly, roughly four joules per kilocalorie. It's not exactly that, but it's approximately that. The problem that organic chemists have is that organic chemists deal with these specific potential energy numbers very often. And many of us have memorized a huge number of these. And we have these and we use these on almost a daily basis in predicting the results of chemical processes. When we try to convert to joules, it turns out that that just seems very unnatural. Those numbers have no meaning for us in the way that kilocalories do. So in this class, we are going to be doing all of our energy numbers in kilocalories. In fact, you will see that I have added kilocalorie columns to some of the charts and tables that we use because these are the numbers that most organic chemists who have been trained up until today understand and have memorized. So in this particular case, we can see that there's about a three kilocalorie difference in energy between the staggered conformation and the eclipsed conformation, with the eclipsed conformation having a much higher potential energy, meaning it's less stable. And as the molecule rotates, we see it goes up in potential energy, then it comes back down, then it goes up and down, it just alternates like that. Now, one of the things we can do with potential energy numbers is we can uh, use them to calculate K equilibrium. Now, K equilibrium is defined as the ratio between the concentration on the right hand side, the concentration on the left hand side. What we can do is we can calculate delta G, which would be this number, three kilocalories. We can plug it in to this equation and we can solve for the log of that and then just take the inverse log. It turns out when we do that, we get numbers that look like this. So zero kilocalories would mean a one-to-one -one ratio of those. They would essentially be approximately equal in concentration. 1.4 kilocalories is a 9 to 1 ratio. 2.8 kilocalories is a 99 to 1 ratio. 4.2 is a 999 to 1 ratio. I don't know if you can see the trend, but basically for every 1.4 kilocalories, we increase in one order of magnitude the ratio between the uh, lower energy one and the higher energy one. So in this case, a three kilocalorie per mole potential energy difference means that there are approximately a hundred staggereds for every one eclipsed at a given time. Or another way to look at it is that the molecule will spend 99% of its time as the staggered and only 1% as the eclipsed. Now, we have a term for this energy change, the potential energy change that occurs when a molecule rotates around bonds. We call it the torsional energy. And the torsional energy is 
one important part of the total amount of potential energy in a molecule. Now, why would the staggered have a lower amount of potential energy than the eclipsed? Well, we believe it is because the staggered conformation has a lower potential energy because the hydrogens are farther apart. The hydrogens themselves have clouds of electrons around them. So as we bring those hydrogens close together in space, we can see that those clouds of electrons would begin to repel each other. That electron repulsion increases the potential energy. We call this type of interaction a steric interaction. Steric interaction is electron repulsion caused by bumping of atoms in three-dimensional space. Or another way to look at it is it's how crowded atoms are in three-dimensional space. The more crowded that the atoms are, the higher the amount of steric interaction. And what we see is that steric interactions usually increase the potential energy of molecule. So, in summary, we can say that the lower energy of the staggered conformation is caused by the fact that it has fewer steric interactions or a lower degree of steric interactions between its hydrogen atoms.